Hello, everyone. We're pleased to be with you today and in the future. We're from the Department of Human Services and in the Child and Family Service Division. A team of us have put together a series of short workshops for the community to provide some tips, strategies, skills, and create connections within the community. This is tough for all of us, and together we can get through it. I want to make you also aware of some of the other webinars we have coming up this week and next week. Tonight we have our Mental Health Awareness Month series, Mental Health and Wellness After Loss of High School, presented by Natalie Edwards. Next week we have Flip It, um, and it stands for Feelings, Limits, Inqu Inquiries, and Prompts, a simple and effective way to respond to challenging behaviors. That's Tuesday, May 26 at 7 p.m. And then we lastly have a Teen Talk for teens from teens, teens coping with COVID as a marginalized community, Thursday, May 28th, there's a 7 p.m. and it's the teens talking to the teens, and at 8 o'clock it's the teens talking to the parents um, and giving them some advice. And I will put this information um, in the chat so that you have access to it, but we will go ahead and get started with our presentation and I will introduce Ms. Jessica Brown. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Jessica Brown. I am the Children's Services Act Coordinator with Arlington De um, Department of Human Services, Child and Family Services Division. Um, today I will be speaking with you all about color, class, color, and COVID. Um, how pandemics expose socio and economic inequities in minority communities. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Brown, Children's Services Act Coordinator of the Department of Human Services in Arlington Child and Family Services Division. Today we'll be talking about class, color, and COVID, how pandemics expose socioeconomic inequities in minority communities. Let's get started. Alrighty, so as we go through this presentation, we're going to talk about some key critical talking points. Um, that includes health, and how COVID has impacted our black and brown communities, employment, how essential workers um, and furlough is impacting our community, and lastly, education, how distance learning is also impacting our community as well. So as we enter the third month of coronavirus and self-quarantine and social distancing, it's important to note how communities are being impacted um, from a personal level, you know, we are experiencing a lot of mental health challenges, isolation, frustration, depression, but it's important to understand how people around um, in other communities outside of our own are impacted by this. And a big piece of this is equity. So I want to get into what equity is. Um, there's a lot of discussion about equity versus equality, and it can often be very confusing. So equity or equality is ensuring that all individuals have access to the same opportunities and resources regardless of age, sex, gender, socioeconomic status, etc. So that is a one size fits all approach where everyone is getting the same of everything. How that differs from equity is equity aims to promote fairness and justice through ensuring people are afforded access to the opportunities and resources specific to their need. So what does that mean? It's essentially, equality is saying that everyone gets a shoe, but equity is saying everyone gets a shoe that fits for them. And so in this diagram, you could see that, you know, there's four individuals with bikes and one individual um, so four individuals all get bikes. That's what equality is. Everyone gets a bike equally. However, you can see that the different types of people are having different challenges accessing the bike that they have. Um, whereas equity, the individuals are getting bikes that are accustomed to their needs, their specific needs. And that is the primary difference between equity and equality. So when we talk about coronavirus and COVID and the health implications and employment implications and educational implications, equity really comes into play because although coronavirus is affecting all of us equally, it's affecting 
certain communities differently based on the resources and needs that they have specific to their challenges. So we're gonna talk a lot about communities of color. And so I wanna be very specific about what that means. So com communities of color refers to African-Americans, including immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean, Latino and Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. And why is this important? According to the Department of, the, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, there are well-documented health needs of people of color when compared to the total population. So there are significant disparities when it comes to health and socioeconomic status when it comes to communities of color. And that's why this um, presentation is so important to talk about as it relates to equity and particularly the health impact um, that coronavirus is having on our community. As we go through this presentation, you'll hear me talk a lot about African-American communities and Latino communities as it relates to communities of color. So here we have some of the recent health facts um, related to COVID and how COVID is impacting us on a national level and on a local level, specific to Arlington County and our surrounding communities, such as Alexandria, Fairfax, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and the District of Columbia. Um, what is typically considered the DC metro area. Um, and this is important because it's important to know the numbers, but it's also important to note that this PowerPoint or this presentation was created just a week ago, and these numbers have changed dramatically. Um, so I just wanna share the total cases nationally when this presentation was created was at 1,435,098. And the total deaths was 87,315. Now, again, I said this was created a week ago. And so I wanna share some of the numbers that I pulled as of today. And as of today, the total number of coronavirus cases is 1,551,000. 1095. That is a difference of almost 120,000 cases in the course of six days. And the total death count is currently 93,061. And that is a difference of nearly 6,000 cases, according to the CDC. So, you know, a lot of people are minimizing the impact of COVID and it's having on our community, but those numbers alone are just staggering. And they're quite frankly, scary considering how quickly this virus is affecting our community. You can see that um, the chart to our right, it breaks down the cases per county. So we have Arlington County. Um, a week ago, it was 1,499. Alexandria County, um, 1,349 cases. Fairfax County, nearly 7,000. Prince George's County, has 10,449. Montgomery County is, you know, close to 8,000 and DC is close to 7,000. So it's showing, you know, the impact of this, especially with these smaller counties. Um, you know, DC, Arlington, Alexandria were not that big. So to have that many cases in such a small area shows the significant gravity of this virus. But I wanna bring your attention to the chart on the left. Um, it describes how COVID is affecting the African-American community in particular. So you can see that on a national level, um, well, I have two different variants here. So the gray bars represent the national population or the population of African-Americans in that particular state or community. And the yellow bars represent the percent of coronavirus deaths in the African-American community. So you can see that number is a little jarring. There's about a 13% population of African-Americans in the United States as, as a whole. However, there are making up 33% of the coronavirus deaths. That's almost three times the amount of the African-American population. 
And when you look at DC, there are 46% of African Americans residing in DC. However, they make up 76% of the coronavirus deaths in DC. Same with Maryland at 29% and 48% of deaths and Virginia with 19% of the population being African American and 35% of the coronavirus deaths. So these are very significantly different numbers exhibiting the health disparity that's occurring in the community specific to African Americans. And so you might be asking, why is that? Why is there such a huge discrepancy or um, disparity in the health outcomes of African Americans as it relates to coronavirus? And so I have a few quick facts here that we want to take into consideration. COVID is disproportionately affecting people who have chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, and other health challenges in spite of gender, race, or culture. That means that coronavirus is affecting anyone who is living with an underlying medical disease. However, African Americans and communities of color are at a disproportionately higher rate for coronavirus than the overall population because of a history of underlying health needs or socioeconomic status. Further, uh, mental health among the communities are increasing due to the increased anxiety, fear, and feelings of isolation. Um, lower economic status may cause families to not engage in social distancing, meaning if you have a family of four or five who might be living in co close quarters, it's really challenging to social distance when everyone is living in that home together. And if you have essential workers who might be leaving the home and returning, it's really challenging to engage in self quarantining or self isolation, which increases the risk of other family members becoming exposed as well. And that leads me to number five, people of color are more likely to serve in essential roles such as grocery clerks, warehouse employees, home health aides in the food industry, and so many other fields. Um, so that increases the level of risk that, you know, people of color are exposed to. And lastly, there's a mistrust, in, uh, a mistrust or health insurance challenges that can cause additional struggles in communities of color. And so it's sometimes we wonder or it's easy to say, you know, if these health disparities or these health challenges, underlying health needs are impacting communities of color, then why can't they just take care of themselves better? And that places a lot of blame and, you know, feelings of irresponsibility on these particular communities. However, that is not the case. There's disproportionate levels of underlying health conditions due to historical um, treatment in healthcare, such as people of color not being heard or advocated for when it comes to their health care. They can be medically undertreated or misdiagnosed, um, or they can be living in communities where health concerns are more apparent, such as communities where there are factories or warehouses or agricultural farms that may expose them to pesticides. Um, and typically, you know, being an essential worker people of color are gravitating to these areas to fulfill the work in those areas, which exposes them to things like air pollution, dirty water, or dirty soil that can ultimately impact their health. Um, there was a study that was done in early April that showed individuals who had long-term exposure of air pollution are more likely to have severe cases of COVID-19. And so that just exemplifies um, the issue, you know, black and brown people are more likely to live in these areas where these conditions exist. And, you know, these environmental impacts are having a greater effect on their underlying health conditions and the way that they are responding to coronavirus. And there's also another interesting note that I read about um, this idea of weathering, which is really fascinating. Weathering is the psychosomatic impact um, 
of living in history of microaggressions, racism, or physical or creating physical impacts such as high blood pressure, undue stress, and other physical health impairments. So living in an environment where racism can be occurring to or be occurring or microaggressions or dealing and navigating with poverty and all of these different economic and environmental concerns are creating physical health implications on our communities. And so that brings us to employment. We talked a lot about essential workers and individuals living in these environments um, where essential work is necessary and they are gravitating towards these communities. Um, and oftentimes, you know, even despite of COVID, people still have to go to work. People are still essential. Thankfully, many of us have the opportunity to work from home, but realistically, that's not an option for a lot of our um, communities, especially our black and brown communities. And so as they're going to work, we're noticing that there's a lack of appropriate personal protective equipment, which increases workers' risk of experiencing symptoms or being exposed to COVID-19 symptoms. Um, people of color are in essential roles, whereas some people have been furloughed completely and are seeking unemployment. Um, there is a gap in childcare access and people being able to go to work with these essential roles, but still having to care for their children who are out of school at this time. And also trying to minimize the risk of their exposure as well. And then lastly, we have challenges with families experiencing unemployment and not having enough to sustain their basic needs, such as food, shelter, um, and utilities, very basic needs that we need to survive. Families may not be able to have access to those same resources. And also it's important to note that unemployment may not be available for individuals with an undocumented immigration status or with other you know, challenges. So that puts them at another deficit for getting the resources that they deserve. And so some of the quick facts that I pulled in doing my research, I found that 130,000 unemployment claims in DC, Maryland, and Virginia were filed in just one week. Just one week. And since um, March, 6.6 .6 million Americans were seeking unemployment benefits. 42% of adults between the ages of 18 and 64 lost their jobs due to COVID. And 41% of the adults are black or brown. And so we kind of spoke to the challenges in terms of child care and families not having access to child care. And a big challenge of that is because schools are not in session right now. And it's it's showing the challenges that students are also having, having to navigate this distance learning and this new mode of education. And some of the major challenges that are being experienced are children with disabilities and having IEP specific needs or you know services that they obtain at school that they would not be able to obtain in their home environment. Some families have a lack of access to appropriate social distance learning equipment, such as Wi-Fi or laptops or tablets. Um, food access is huge. There's several students who go to school just to get their meals. And without the schools being in session, you know, we're concerned about where are families getting their meals from, how are kids eating and sustaining themselves, and there are a lot of schools who are kind of picking up and engaging in school pickups or school lunch pickups um, or farmers markets that are socially distancing appropriate. However, that still remains a deficit for some of our families. And students that have a limited English proficiency may not have the same resources or support that they would have in a normal classroom setting. So it's 
it's an incredible challenge that a lot of our families are facing as they're trying to navigate these different implications of coronavirus, um, especially with our children with disabilities and not having you know, access to one-on-one -on -one support or having access to ask questions or having the classroom environment that might help provide some sense of structure and stability and access to equipment with our families that may not have access to tablets or may not have access to laptops or stable Wi-Fi to complete the necessary assignments. And when we're talking about this issue versus equity and equality, some school districts have offered you know, students to borrow equipment during this time to improve on social, on um, distance learning. However, the equity piece of it is just because everyone gets a laptop doesn't mean that those needs are still being met for the specific students that are having their challenges. And so, Lastly, I just wanted to provide a few resources that may be beneficial for ongoing support or education. Um, Arlington County has a food, financial, and medical assistance for neighbors in need. So that is definitely a resource to check out if you're an Arlington resident. And I've broken it up by health, employment, and education um, for additional resources or continued learning. Um, Suicide Prevention Hotline and Mental Health America as well as Psychology Today are great resources for identifying a therapist or identifying mental health resources as we navigate this, this time that could be very challenging on our mental and emotional health. Um, finding the updates on the CDC for the coronavirus data if you're interested in learning the numbers or if you're interested in learning what to do if you are exhibiting symptoms. Um, some hospitals are not doing are not doing coronavirus testing if you're asymptomatic, meaning that you do not show symptoms, but that doesn't mean that you may not be a carrier. So it's a little challenging of how to navigate or understanding when to navigate access to testing. I've also included some employment resources um, for Virginia Department of Unemployment Services. Um, DC Project Empowerment has a really great project. Um, for additional funding if you are experiencing unemployment or job loss due to coronavirus, as well as DC Jobs with Justice and National Employment Law Project. Those are also great resources of navigating how to file unemployment or if you're eligible. And then for our educational resources, of course, we have Arlington Public Schools who regularly updates their website with coronavirus updates or resources um, for distance education and distance learning. And there's a really great link to the grab and go meal pickup schedule. So there are several schools around Arlington who are offering meal pickup services if you are someone who may be experiencing a lack um, of food access. And another great reading is Reducing the Distance, Equity and Distance Learning and Public Education. It's a great read if you're learning, if you're interested in learning more about the equity crisis and challenges that people are having as they navigate COVID-19. And that is all I have for today. So I will turn it over for any questions, comments that I may be able to answer. Okay, so doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. So we can provide the resources for you on the webinar link. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, or if you just want to talk about this um, discussion further, I would love to chat with you guys. Thank you.